Hi, and welcome to everybody to uh, this photography course of The Wild Ones uh, with Kathy Davis, who will be your uh, tuition leader on this course. I am here, Tamar Peters, as her assistant, just handling all the technical bits and pieces. So, uh, hi, Kathy. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Tamar. <laughs> Glad to be here. <laughs> So, um, let's get on with the presentation. What I'm going to do is, uh, we've got a slide uh, show presentation, which has got lots of lovely, fantastic photos that Kathy has taken. Um, and so I'm gonna start that presentation now. So just hang on a second while I share my screen. Uh, let's get that up and share. Screen. And Hopefully now everybody can just stop my video. Oh, actually, um, just going into that. And I'm going to do the slideshow. Kathy, can you see the slideshow? Yes, I can. Great, okay. And we'll start from the beginning. We'll start from the beginning. There we go. So this is our um, first wonderful uh, wildlife photography course uh, by Kathy Davis. We're very excited to uh, share this with you. Uh, and it really comes out of our wonderful trip we had to Kenya last year. And it was very helpful to have Kathy there, uh, giving us some really hot tips on how to uh, do proper or better wildlife photography. Um, and so thought it would be a good idea to put that into a course. And so we could share that with everybody. So the agenda uh, for this presentation is just an introduction uh, to Kathy Davis herself, uh, how to best be prepared before you go out, um, uh, obviously before you go uh, taking photographs, educating yourself about what you might see, and this is really important, um, you know, especially if you know where you're going and you want to photograph a particular animal or if you know you're going on a trip, is to do a little bit of research behind it. So Kathy will be sharing much more about that in her presentation. Uh, being aware of your surroundings uh, when you're out in the wild, so it's not just about the subject matter, it's everything around it. Paying attention to the details of your photos, and there's lots of fantastic tips that Kathy will be sharing with us. Your feelings and reasons for taking the photograph, and this that's a really important part of what we're going to be talking about and sharing with you because it really does alter the energy of the photograph that you take. So a very important part of the teaching for today. And uh, photography rules that you might want to break, which are always exciting, <laughs> to break the rules, and editing your photos after you've taken them. Um, we're not gonna go into too much of technical detail there, but just some really uh, simple tips that anybody can do um, on their camera or on their mobile phone. So, um, Kathy Davis is our tutor expert today. Um, I'm here just to assist Kathy with the technical uh, side of today's presentation. So, Kathy, over to you. Thank you, Tamar. Um, well, thank you, everybody, for joining me today. Um, I was just a little bit about myself and, and what, how I got to where I am today. I grew up in Maine and in the summertime spent. Um, all my summer on a very small island off the coast of Maine where there were no TVs, certainly no cell phones, I'm too old for that, um, no cars, no stores. We were just always, always outside every minute of the day. Um, so I grew to love nature, love the animals that were there. Deer had swum over to the island, so we saw a lot of deer. Um, and now my passion is spending time out in the wild and photographing the birds and the animals. Um, I'll take a photo of anything. I even took a, we had a frog and a plant inside our house one day. I took the photo of that as well. Um, but I practice out in my own backyard with the birds and animals that come there. Um, I will drive pretty much any distance to see something if it's, if it's really interests me. Um, and I've been on some wonderful trips. 
Um, the highlight, of course, was going with Tamar to Kenya. Um, but I've also been to India with the tigers and the elephants there and Churchill, Manitoba for the polar bears and uh, Minnesota for great, great owls and black bears. So I just, it, I just am very happy doing all of this. And it also is very important for me to share my photos with people. Uh, my hope is that people will connect emotionally with what they see in, in, the, in the photos. And then that would lead to protecting the animals as well as their environment. And that way we can all thrive and not just survive. As, as Tamar said, I'm not going to be talking about the technical end of things, but rather just getting the highest quality photo that you can from the camera that you have, whether it's a cell phone, a point and shoot camera, or a camera that has interchangeable lenses. So that's a little bit about me. And um, now we can get to the nitty gritty of taking good photos. Um, the first thing that I want to talk about is preparation. That is really, uh, a really important um, um, way to be so you, you have everything you need when you go out. The first and foremost important thing to do is to make sure your battery is charged in your camera when you go out. If you have a camera that requires uh, many more batteries than just taking a few photos, you want to take extra batteries with you. Also take extra cards if your camera has that. Um, that is, there's nothing worse than being out there and a bear walks in front of you and you don't, and your battery dies. So keep, keep the batteries charged. Uh, check on the weather before you go out, both for not only yourself, but for the camera as well. Uh, if, it, if rain is planned, um, make sure you have something to protect your camera. Uh, you can buy a fancy lens cover or you could just use a shower cap or even a plastic bag works really well. Um, if it's going to be cold out, the little uh, hand warmers and toe warmers that keep your hands warm for a good 10 hours uh, will be really handy because if you lose feeling in your hands and your fingers, it's really difficult to know that your finger's on a button to take the picture. Um, if you're going on a trip, the best thing to do is when you're out locally around, think what you might need if you're on a trip. Because if you're out in the middle of the um, Maasai Mara in Africa, you're not going to go to the local store to get an extra card. So just think what, what you're using now, make sure you have it packed when you go on a trip. Make a list of what you want on your trip and do it long before you leave because you'll add to it and you'll think of things as time goes on and you can just add that to the list. And if it's on the list, you don't have to think about it. You can just put it in your suitcase. Um, start as again, start every trip with charged batteries and remember all the, go through all the things you're going to need. You're going to need batteries. You'll need chargers for the batteries, the cords that go from your, to your computer or your charger, uh, extra cards. If you have them, it's, if you're on a long trip, it's a really good idea if you can to bring an extra camera and extra lenses if you need it, or even a video camera. Things happen and if you only have one camera and it dies or breaks, then you'll be wanting, wishing you had an extra one. So if you have it, bring it along too. Uh, take with you also, this is very important, when you're staying in a room, there may not be very many outlets. So if you take with you a power strip or a square, one of those square power things where you can plug more than one thing into it, uh, that will be very helpful. If you have a roommate and you're sharing outlets, you'll be really glad you've got that uh, extra power strip. Um, and if you're going overseas, make sure you put, find out what um, well, just take a converter that would convert the power to what you need. Um, and some of those power strips also have USB ports, and that's handy as well. Before leaving home, uh, you're, it's a good idea, it's fun to research what animals and birds you might be likely to see. That way, if you understand their behavior, uh, you will 
definitely get a better picture. Um, in lo learn what kind of habitat you'll find them. For example, a great horned owl you would find in the woods or a, a dead tree in a bog. But if you were looking for a short-eared owl, you would look over fields and, and the timing, you'd look at dusk. So just un learn what the animals do and when they're out, what time of day they're most active, and what time of year. Sometimes birds particularly migrate through. So learn when that happens and what kind of wind. Um, if it's a northwest wind around here, we're most likely to see the hawks come migrating through. Um, also, do they, do, with the raptors, do they hunt? If so, a snowy owl will sit on top of a mound or a tree and, and hunt that way, where a short-eared owl will fly over the field um, and hunt. Um, another very important thing to do is get to know your camera. If you, if you have just bought a new camera for the trip, practice before you leave because then you'll know what to do when you get there and, and it, it will uh, you can start having great pictures right away rather than trying to figure out what settings things should be on um, when you do get to a, a location a photo location and you know you're going to be seeing things take a take a uh, shot and and look at the picture and see if you need to adjust make it lighter or darker, or um, you want to make sure the shutter speed is up um, and take lots of pictures because in today's world with digital cameras, you can take thousands of pictures and delete hundreds of pictures. So just take them and, uh, and delete later. One thing I like to do is find around my home is a sit spot which would be a, a favorite spot to go to. And you can just sit there and you can, un, you can just be with nature. And also you, what will happen is the birds and animals that typically go to that area will get used to you. Um, and and they'll, be, they'll come in and they won't be bothered by you if you're sitting there quietly. Um, right now our next door neighbor has a, a fox, baby fox family in their yard and I've gone with over with my car and just parked there to, so they're used to my car being there so you you um, that way you'll they'll be more comfortable and come out and play um, you develop a relationship with them but just keep your energy very quiet while doing that and you need to put in the hours it, it does take a lot of time to do it um, but if you enjoy that quiet uh, quietude with without the animals and birds there it, it is just a very special um, time for you and the next slide will show an example of keeping the shutter speed up this hummingbird it, it's it's very difficult to stop the wings on a hummingbird they're going so quickly but this hummingbird as you can see I've done that uh, it's easier on a sunny day you'll get a faster shutter speed that way and um, the next thing is you want to educate yourself about what you might see. Here is a picture of a short-eared owl that I was talking about earlier. As you can see, the sun was going down and, and there's a field there. And that little owl, um, I know that that's when I will look for an owl, a short-eared owl. I will not look for one in the middle of the day. Um, Snowy owls, for example, they're used to daylight all the time when they're up above the Arctic Circle. So when they come down here, they're out hunting uh, in the daytime. A favorite shot of, of an animal, of a bird that he, often photographers want to get is the bird taking off. And if you know their behavior ahead of time, what they look like when they're about to take off, it will save you uh, it will get you the good shot. A snowy owl will literally sit there for six hours and doing nothing. But if you see what this snowy owl is doing on the left, its head has gone down and its tail has gone up. That very often means that it may be pooping, it may not be, but if that happens, and as you can see the next shot, the owl took off. So when you see that tail go up, 
be prepared and to, to start taking photos. Um, preening, which is a, um, another example of where, where birds will clean their feathers and they're getting sort of fidgety, very often they'll take off after that as well. Um, a duck will often bob their heads underwater and down and down and up. And what they will do when they finish doing that bobbing in the water is they will sit high in the water and flap their wings to splash off the water. And that's a really nice shot to get as well. So when you see them start to duck their head and bobbing up and down, have your camera zoomed in on that duck. Geese will very often start, start honking before taking off. Um, and if you know that, I was once photographing a barnacle goose that was mixed in with th about 350 Canada geese. Very unusual to find that. People came from around the country to see this one barnacle goose. It's very similar looking to a Canada goose, but a little bit different. I knew when they started to honk that it was going to take off. And so I, I uh, zoomed in on that one barnacle goose. And as I anticipated, they did take off. I got one of my best and most unusual shots that way. They were, they banked around and you, and I, you can see the barnacle goose was surrounded by the Canada geese. And actually that picture ended up in the handbook of bird biology from Cornell labs um, because it was so unusual. If I had not been on that, goose before they took off, I never would have found it in the air. So that's really important to do that. Um, and I always want to be aware of the birds and animal behaviors. If you're outside and you're looking out at a marsh and suddenly all the ducks go up in the air, more than likely an eagle will be coming along or some sort of a raptor. The ducks will want to be in the air when there's a predator around, they're safer that way. So if you know that, look around and see if you see an eagle flying over. Um, crows are very noisy. It's a great way to find, find an owl. Uh, they'll be dive bombing a tree and if you look in the tree, you may see the, either that an, that an, a nest or perhaps the owl or the owl itself. Um, sometimes you're out and you hear all the songbirds chirping and whatnot and suddenly it becomes quiet. That would mean more than likely that a um, hawk might be coming along. So that's interesting, Kathy, because in the wild, um, certainly in the bush, you find that um, the birds are normally quite quiet uh, and certain ones uh, start to shriek and have a shrill and it's like an alarm system for a lot of the antelope that a predator is nearby. Exactly. Yeah. So it's anything that's different than what ordinarily happens. Um, sure. in, in, in the bush, they're usually, as you say, it's the opposite of what these little songbirds do. Yeah. Yeah. The, the chickadee will, the chickadee makes a chickadee D sound. Mm -hmm. And the more D D Ds on the end of the chickadee D D, the it's higher the alarm call. Right. Um, a deer, when, they, when they're frightened, their tail will go up. We have white-tailed deer around here, and you see all the white underneath the tail. Um, and the, um, in India, there are spotted deer and monkeys, and they, sort of, they hang out together, and they help each other. The spotted deer will cry out when a tiger is approaching. Sure. And that warns, they, they um, smell the deer, the tiger coming. The monkeys who are near them, they're high in the trees and they can see the, the tiger coming. Yeah. And so the, they warn the deer and the deer warn the monkeys. So it's a symbiotic relationship there. Wonderful. And um, one thing you don't, if you see, if you're looking at an animal, you don't want to make direct eye contact with them. That would be a threat to them and they would be afraid and probably leave. So if you can just sort of Basically, casu be casual. Don't just, you don't want to be frozen because that is a, it's, it's a, um, it's, they will feel they're being stalked if you're frozen. If you're just moving around gently and quietly, that is a more normal behavior that they can accept. Um, sometimes, as far as educating yourself, 
if you see a bird in the sky and it's very bright, you, you can't see the detail of what the bird is. But if you know, for example, the shape of their wings, that can help you. There are different kinds of hawks. They have different kinds of shapes of wings. Some are more pointed, some are rounded. Um, then you'll know what kind of a hawk might be coming in. Uh, learn how they flap their wings while they're flying. Woodpeckers um, have a very um, scalloped flight pattern to them. And so you know that, that would be a woodpecker flying by. Some birds hover, like an osprey or a northern harrier. They will hover over the, over the field looking for prey. So if you know all of this, uh, you can, it's the first step to knowing what kind of a bird you're seeing before you actually can tell the detail of, the, of it. Um, you want to anticipate the movement of these, particularly the birds. Birds will, most birds will take off into the wind. So if you're taking a photo of a bird, you want to be downwind of the bird so it'll come toward you and you won't get the rear end of the bird flying by. <clears throat> and as I say, this snowy owl, you didn't see it poop, but you saw the tail go up and, the, and it took off. And the next slide is pretty clear what's happening here with this um, immature eagle. It, it pooped and then it took off. Usually within about 20 seconds, the bird will take off like that. And I mentioned the ducks dunking, dunking under the water. This is a wood duck and it was up and down in the water, that upper left picture, and then it did the beautiful flapping of the wings. Um, the next is be aware of your surroundings. Um, you want to listen to the, well, I should, uh, um, yeah, that, that actually on that backslide, I'm sorry. Um, that was a barred owl that ha had um, flown down right at my feet. And when I looked at the picture that I took of it, you can see there were about six or seven of us and you can see our reflection in the eye of the bird. So that was just kind of a fun, fun picture. <laughs> um, when you're out, you want to become aware of the sounds that you that you hear if you hear the as we were talking before the alarm calls by the crows or um, any birds or animals rustling of leaves um, just any your ears are almost as important as your eyes listening for the sounds as well as the lack of sounds um, as i mentioned earlier that will help you find what you're looking to photograph you want to be aware of shadows. If it's a sunny day, we all love sunny days, but sometimes it's harder to take a photo on a sunny day because you're dealing with shadows. And if you can, uh, try to not to have them going across the animal that you're photographing. Um, a cloudy day is much easier because you don't have to deal with the shadows, but you don't get the nice clarity of a sunny day. Um, Positioning yourself correctly, it's very often it's nice to shoot from a low position. Um, so you can either scooch down or be on the ground rather than looking down. You'll get a much nicer shot from a low position. And um, if, you're, if you're photographing an animal, if you're downwind of the animal, your scent will be carried away. If, so it's better to be with an animal downwind upwind of the bird because it'll take off into your toward you um, as far as photographer etiquette goes definitely you do not want to get too close to the animal or the bird it's better to have a camera that has a longer lens so you can be back you you don't Animals rest often during the day, birds as well as animals. Lions resting, they need that energy, that rest, and it's too hot for them to move. Um, snowy owls need to be eating their food and not being moving around because of people. So it's very, very important to stay relatively far away from these animals where they're not afraid. And you can tell if they become afraid, um, just back away. Uh, keep your energy quiet. 
uh, you can, this is where communicating with these animals just um, basically ask permission to take their photo. You will get a better response that way. And then just to be polite with other people, if there are other people around, do not block the view of the other photographers. They won't be happy with you if you do. <laughs> um, when you're out and you don't see anything, you can look for signs of animals. If it's, you can look for their tracks. If it's, a, if there's snow on the ground or mud, you can see, if you see their tracks, you can tell a lot from the tracks. You can tell if you learn how to do it, if it's a canine or a feline, uh, if they're running or walking. Um, some animals walk in a zigzag pattern and some walk in a straight pattern. So with the fox, some do that. So <clears throat> if you see the track, you'll know what, if you're looking for a red fox or a gray fox. Mm -hmm. uh, also signs where an animal has bedded down. Deer will very often bed down under a tree. <clears throat> and you'll know that that's an area where you'll find deer. If you're, for example, up in northern Maine and you're looking for moose, you would look for broken limbs on the side of the road uh, or eaten branches and you'll know moose have been by, as well as their tracks. Um, with owls, owls will always, when they eat an, an animal, they will cough up what is called a pellet and the pellet will have the bones and feathers of the animal they've eaten. They can't digest it. So they cough up these pellets <clears throat> and you'll find them at the bottom of trees very often. And if you see that, look up and see if you see an owl or the nest. <clears throat> the um, great gray owl, you will find what is called a ground strike in the snow and that's where they Come, they will hear an animal under the ground, under the snow, up to two feet. Wow. They will pounce into the snow and they leave a very distinctive pattern. Um, so if you see that, then look around in the trees and you may very well see the great gray owl. Look for, basically look for something that's out of the ordinary. Scan the area with your eyes and if you're seeing a lot of tree branches in the winter, there are no leaves, and then suddenly you see a dark spot in a tree. Take a look at that and, and it may be an animal up there if they climb trees or more than likely a bird. Also look for unusual movement. If, you, um, if the bushes are moving and it's not windy, hang out there for a minute and see what pops out of the bushes. Um, in Africa, you can look for elephant dung, which you will see everywhere. Uh, and you can tell if it's fresh or if it's old. If it's fresh, then you've got an elephant nearby. Um, and another thing to look for, if it has snowed recently and there are two or three inches of snow along each of the branches, if you see a break in that snow, then you know some bird has been there and knocked the snow off. And the next slide shows the example of the unwanted uh, shadows. You can see on this barred owl, they have beautiful markings all over the owl, but it, it's broken up by the shadows. So it's a picture that is not a great photo. It's a cute one of his little eyes, but, um, but you've got the shadows all over him. So you, you preferably would not want that. And then the next one shows this chipmunk where I was show, shooting from a low position. It's way better than if I'd come down from the top. Um, the, when you've taken the shot, the photo, you want to pay attention to the details in your photos, which means um, this, is the, this polar bear is an example of having the light behind me. It's a very low light in the sky. Um, it gives much greater detail. It's very difficult, especially on something that's white. Um, so, so you can adjust the, the uh, camera settings to get this kind of a picture, um, but just pay attention to that. And when you take a picture, look at it and see if you've blown out the white, which means it's just all white and no detail, and darken the picture down until you get more detail. Uh, the light is 
very, very important with a picture. There's something that is called the golden hour. And this picture of the snowy owl taking off is in the golden hour. It's about an hour before the sun comes up and an hour after this, before, an hour before and after dark, basically, in a nutshell. Um, and you can see you get a beautiful golden light with it. Uh, usually you put, try to put the sun behind you. If you take photos in the midday, the sun's coming down from the top and you'll never get the detail or the most, the beautiful light. It's, it's too harsh that way. And this is a very good example of, of the golden uh, hour there. Um, it's also a good example of the foreground and the background. Uh, be, just be mindful, you, you, if you get a beautiful shot of whatever you're taking and there's a building right behind you or a telephone pole, you really don't want that. Uh, so if you can position yourself accordingly, you may want trees or you may not, um, but position yourself so you get, pay attention to the background and the foreground. This is an example, I did want the grasses there to show what land, it was a mound of, of sand there with marshes or grasses on the, on the sand dune. I did want that, but I didn't want it in its face. So um, you have to be careful. Sometimes you will get little pieces of grass up in their face or right across their eye. and Just pay attention to that kind of thing. Um, composition is important. There is something called the rule of thirds in photography, where if you most, this is one of the rules you can break, but for the most part, um, you want to have the animal or bird not right in the middle of the picture. It's more static that way. If you have it a little bit off center, a third, if you divide each way, the horizontal in third and the vertical in third, that's a, you, and put the animal on those intersections, that is the best, more than, most often, the best way to do it. And this snowy owl is an example of that. Um, and also, if you've taken a picture and the horizon is off center, just crop it a bit so you can make it horizontal. An off uh, or a tipped horizon is not a, most often, not what you want to see. Um, you can vary your shots. Shoot from a long way away or, or close up. If you shoot from a long way away, you will get more of the environment, and that's a great thing to show sometimes, the, the animal and its environment. But if you want to have more detail in the animal, zoom in and you can get just the animal and a little bit of the background. Um, if you're, when you're focusing the, your camera, it's best to focus right on the eye. This will help the viewer make a connection between the subject and, and the viewer, and it will bring you right into the picture. It, it's a, um, it, it's a, a connection, makes a really good connection between you and the picture. Yeah, it's a great and, template. <laughs> yeah. It just, it, the eye is a really important part of this whole thing. Um, and make sure that the photo is sharp. That you can do by keeping the, the shutter speed up if you have that on your camera and, and keeping the camera steady when you take the picture. So the next sh slide shows an example of the um, wide shot and the close shot. Same picture, but the, the wide shot shows the, the the watering hole in the front with the birds and, and the whole um, landscape of, the, of what we were seeing. And then the close-up has a more, um, more detail of the babies with the adult elephants there. And the next shot is a great example of focusing on the eyes. Of course, the shot was kind of funny anyway too, but um, any picture you're taking, do, do um, focus on the eyes. That's that incredible, it was in mid-flight. Yes. Wow. It had just taken, you can see the water splashing from yeah. the yeah. back. And it had just taken it off and the wings come like that normally, but he was looking right at me. So it was one yeah. of those fun shots. Um, you want to, th these next series are why basically why am I taking this, these photos? Um, 
the here is a picture that I love to take birds taking off, but this one has many things in it. It's the bird, this is a, um, a snowy egret, small egret, and the snowy uh, egret is taking off. You can see the water splashing from its talon and it just has taken off. And um, you can see the full reflection of the bird in the water. And what you're looking at in the, in the water is it was very, very clear and very still. And you are seeing the rocks and the sand and the seaweed underneath. Very it's unusual. Because it looks like it's the reflection of the sky, but then you look closer and you yeah. know it's actually the, um, yeah, the ground underneath the water. Yep, yeah, exactly. And I thought it was the clouds at first when I first took the picture. And not until I looked, that's another thing, not until you really look at your pictures will you find things that you never knew you had. <laughs> um, the next one, I like to take pictures of mothers and babies. It shows, it just gives you a good warm feeling inside. And you can see in both these pictures the, the love that's existing between the, um, the bear, black bear mother, adoringly looking at her little cub and the little raccoon baby who had recently fallen out of the tree and the mother, and we were there when that happened, the mother climbed down the tree, grabbed the baby and took her back up for him, back up into the hole and safe and sound under mom. So it just gives you a warm feeling from the viewer. Um, the action shots are fun to have, but splashing water always shows action, as you can see with the, elephant and the wild dogs and then the deer running he's all feet four feet are in the air and it's it's on the move <laughs> a series of photos will will um, tell a picture this this is we i was in india and we came around the corner and there was the mother tiger and her cub and very shortly i was taking pictures and then suddenly i saw two little ears over there and then I saw four little ears, and then four little eyes, and then they got a little higher. So that, so mom, she was actually nursing those, those cubs. They tell a story. I'm just gonna run through that series because you can see through the shutter speed. That's how quickly that happened. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Wonderful. That was a special moment. Yeah. Um, be creative when you take pictures, you, and you can do that by by zooming in. As I told you before about the owl, with the you could see our reflection in the eyeball. So I zoomed right in. I have a bigger picture of that face, but um, that was a fun thing to see. And over on the left, the um, I have the, all the elephants there, which I that's why I was taking pictures of the elephant. But I thought it was fun to sort of give the suggestion of the elephants with their trunks and tusks and the little bird underneath there. Um, this is a tufted titmouse, a very common bird in where we live. And this was my practicing at our house. Uh, it was snowing, so the little bird was on the branch in the snow. And But even practice on seagulls, that's a good way to practice. Anything, just um, it helps you with your what you're planning to do. Um, and just go out all times of the day and it's putting in the time again. Mm -hmm. uh, reflection, re reflections in the water is fun. When you do that, make sure you've got the subject up high enough so you get the full reflection. That's sometimes that's difficult to do if you have your center spot on your camera focusing on the, in this example, the deer. Um, you need to raise it up a little bit so that you can get the whole reflection underneath. Um, and you can see the deer and the tiger in the watering hole looking at me. <laughs> and then uh, the little red squirrel with a little face. So that's a fun thing to do and practice with that. Uh, sometimes you can frame the, little, the animal that you're looking at. These are just di different examples of the framing and how you do it. Um, the, the red squirrel in the middle, you can see it's sort of the suggestion of a frame with three quarters with the bushes. Uh, the little screech owl on the right is framed automatically by its hole. 
uh, and the rocks, and then the color of the, the moose is standing in the middle of the lighter color grasses. Uh, if you're trying to photograph something that's really little and really fast, that's very difficult to do. So what I did in this case is I, I focused on the dragonfly that was sitting on the branch and then waited until the other dragonfly came into the same plane so it would be uh, in focus as well. So that's just a matter of playing with it and doing the best you can because that's yeah. tough to get a dragon. <laughs> It's tough to get them in flight, I'll tell you. Um, um, and this is the interaction between different species. Sometimes, now the, 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 sometimes it can be a symbiotic relationship. The oxpecker birds on the right with a the zebra, um, they will eat the bugs off of the um, zebra and they all, will also warn the zebra of a predator. And the zebra gets the bugs taken off him and feels much better. So that's a clear, cl a classic example of a symbiotic relationship. Sometimes I just take the pictures because two different species in the same photo because I love them. And that I just adore the um, warthog with the peacock. I just think they're kind of looking at each other. And the squirrel and the bunny surprise each other when they, the bunny came hopping out of the bushes and there was the squirrel. So. That's always a fun one. And here's another situation where the lions were under the tree and the uh, family of elephants were walking by and they qu quickly protected the young ones. And then you've got an ostrich in the background. And this was very far away. So very. I'm surprised that you were able to get any definition or, clar or clarity in it. It's amazing. Well, that's why I have a, a zoom lens. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. <laughs> and then I cropped it. <laughs> um, a glint in the eye of, of if you can, it, get that glint. And the glint is that there are those two little white dots. It's basically a reflection of the sun. If the bird or animal is looking up a bit, you'll get that glint. Very often they're not, but it's a much better picture. It gives you um, the bird is more three-dimensional if you see it, mm -hmm. the little highlight in the eye. It makes, otherwise it's too dark. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, you take pictures, some are better than others, but sometimes they may not be the best picture, but you love the picture. So that's one to save as well. The, um, the giraffe on the left, it's not the best shot in the world, but it's awfully cute. You can see the eyelashes of the giraffe and the mouth askew just warmed my heart when I saw it. Um, and then the two red foxes are gray when they are born. And for the first month, they are gray with blue eyes. And these two little very young gray foxes came out of the den and they were rolling around and wrestling. And I just thought that was an adorable picture, but it's it's not going to win a National Geographic Award, but it's a cute picture. <laughs> <laughs> um, positioning yourself for the best photo is something that you, as I had mentioned before, this was a case where the owl was on top of the pole. The moon, I saw the moon begin to come up and I waited about an hour and positioned myself so it would be there. And there's the picture of the owl with the moon. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Um, sometimes the background makes the photo. This is not a great photo of the coyote. However, the whole picture together, I do love it. It's, uh, you've got the road with the bend, the sun was, was in that um, magic hour right before the sun was setting. And um, I just, the lighting I think makes it, and the, the road, the gray gravel road. So that's why pay attention to the background. I personally like to photograph things that are unusual. Uh, here are some examples, a snowy owl looking down in the skylight of the roof. I was driving by this house, saw it, backed up, got myself where I could see it, and there it is, appears to be looking down through the skylight saying, what are you doing down there? <laughs> but um, I, I just love that one. And, and it's got its beak open too. Yeah, 
it's actually yawning, but it kind of looks like it's talking. <laughs> Um, the, the photo in the middle is the snowy owls from around here travel about 5,000 miles to get here. So my thought on this picture is this owl is thinking to itself, himself, can I hitch a ride to go home? <laughs> so, and then uh, very often people will put um, fake owls on, on their roof, which keeps birds away. So here is a fake owl on a porch and right above it is the snowy owl sitting there. It didn't fool him at all. <laughs> and then the chickadee is watching a drip of water and it, it, I just happened to catch it right as the water was popping up and just a fun different picture. Um, and the, the, I love to show animals doing, behaving how they behave. This is a red tailed hawk. They very often hunt in the fields and they zoom in on a mouse and, or a vole. And so this one was feeding. Uh, and then the one on the right is a mother deer nursing her baby. I was in my car taking that photo. It just happened right by the side of the road. And that was a very special thing to see. Too sweet. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I take a picture just because they're cute. <laughs> and this, there's no other reason. It was just as cute as it could be, this little sea otter. They are adorable. Mm -hmm. I could spend all day taking photographs of them. I know, they're so cute. And I love their story. They, hang, they hold hands when they go to sleep at night so they don't separate and they wrap themselves in the kelp seaweed so that they don't float away. And they just, and their faces, you just can't get any cuter than that. <laughs> Um, now, th there are some rules that I was telling you about, a few of them, that you might want to break. And this next photo shows one, that one rule is never shoot directly into the sun. Well, both of these shots I shot directly into the sun. The one on the left, the sun was just coming up. That is the color. I did nothing to that photo. It, um, it was a, about six in the morning and it was very misty up in Maine. And we came around a corner and there was the basically a silhouette of the moose standing right there in the road. So uh, it's a, I just love that shot. And the, um, if you shoot an animal into the sun, very often you'll get this halo effect around there where the fur is, is uh, not protected by the body. So it's, it's a really um, fun thing to do. So that kind of gives it a, a little white outline. Mm -hmm. too exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. This is the classic example of breaking the rule of thirds. These three, the tiger, the wolf, and the lioness, were all looking straight at me. So I put them in the center of the photo. It, it's more emphasis that way. And you really can connect that way too. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> um, and one rule which i really don't believe in but a rule is don't shoot from behind your subject but the, the in the case of these polar bears this was a mother and her cub uh running and they will when they see a male coming which there was a male coming from the right they uh mother will lead the fem the cub away the males will kill the cub so she would she will they both were running away and the tiger just I love that shot. It's sort of, I'm on a mission and I'm going over this hill. And in this case, he was going to the watering hole. Um, but it just, it's like, a, it, it, it evokes a lot of emotion when I see that photo. Well, and especially because you can see his um, paw print. Yes. Accentuated. And you wouldn't normally see it unless you're taking it from the back. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Amazing. That's a fun one. Um, never have the rule. Never have the horizon in the center of the photo. Well, this reflection was so perfect because the water was so quiet. Um, I did put the horizon right in the middle. So it's fun. Uh, and then never shoot through glass, through a window. Uh, these both. I took these both these shots for, through the window. Um, the cardinal. 
I took out our front window, front in the living room, um, straight through the window, and I, you know, if it comes out, it does some, it's hard. You have to have clean windows. Because <laughs> yes. I, I mean, you cannot see the windows at all, you know, the glass, maybe no. a little bit on the, on the, um, the red bird, but definitely not on the raccoon on the right. No, and that was at night. Uh, he, we have a motion detector light out on our back porch and we have bird feeders there though. You can see the two poles. Ah, so that's what he was doing is coming uh, to steal some. Yes. And not only is she doing that, she's bringing her four little babies to do it. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Caught her in the act. Uh -huh. Very guilty. <laughs> right. <laughs> but that was right through our, our sliding glass door. Amazing. Wow. Yep. So you can do it. And then um, the rule of always make the, the uh, shoot sharp pictures. The bird itself is sharp, the flower is sharp, but the wings are blurred. And what that does is show movement. And sometimes you want to do that. Um, if, if an animal is running, you may want to, but have part of it sharp. The eye, again, is sharp, uh, but it does show movement on that hummingbird. Well, it's the contrast between that, you know, blurred wings and the rest of it being so sharp. It's lovely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it does, it's an effect you can, it, you might want to have. Um, and as far as editing my pictures, I, um, I try to do it just based on the picture. Um, this one would be tall and thin because the giraffes are, it's a tall and thin picture. And just, that's up to you which size you feel fits the best. Uh, the next one of the egrets, it's, they're a little bit farther apart. Um, and so I, I made it five by seven instead of the tall skinny one. You also get a little closer if you crop it this way. If I cropped it tall and thin, it would, the egrets would have been smaller. Mm -hmm. And then the, uh, last one is the tiger. I do have the picture, the full picture is of the full tiger lying there, but I cropped it to square because I just thought that would be the best that way. And uh, in the post-processing department, you can lighten photos, you can darken them, depending on what you want, sharpen them, but I would caution from sharpening them too much um, because that can look fake. I, I per personally like to my photos to look like what I saw out in the wild. Fantastic. So, um, so I'm gonna stop sharing the... Um presentation now and take us back to um, having us on screen. So hopefully everybody can see us again. <laughs> Great. So um, in closing, I'd just like to say, go out, have a lot of fun, take lots of photos because you can always delete them. Um, when you get them on your on your computer or put them in a book. You can relive that experience over and over again forever. Put it on a DVD, put music to it, do whatever you want. And uh, basically the, my goal for this webinar was to help you take the best possible pictures to preserve your memories with the equipment, the best equipment you have. Mm -hmm. Put in the hours, practice, practice, practice. Um, but mostly go out and have fun. I hope this has been helpful to you. That's fantastic, Kathy. It has been. I mean, there's so many, and I, I've been practicing. I've got a, a new mobile phone. So I've been practicing crazy. You might have seen quite a few pictures on um, uh, Facebook, but I've been practicing. I even went to a, a little uh, sanctuary for birds and, and so on. And so doing, you know, using all those little um nuggets of wisdom that you share those little uh pieces of guidance um mm -hmm. and, and just practicing yeah so yes taking tons of pictures and coming up with four or five really nice ones out of them but it's been it's been good it's been good fun you know positioning myself that you know sitting in that spot so they get used to you um just connecting with them heart to heart so um i've certainly found it very helpful and i i pretty much won't be taking the same photos as i did last year on the trip i'll be do, yeah, doing it differently this year that's for sure and, and one thing i forgot to mention if you're out like I was the other day, I was driving out to take photos. 
and I passed a car and I noticed in my rearview mirror it stopped and turned around and there was no reason for it so I thought why did that car turn around <laughs> could have been that they forgot their toothbrush or something <laughs> but anyway, it turned out there was a a hawk sitting on the pole right there right so just That's be right. aware of all of your surroundings at all times yeah and may, you'll be amazed what you see and i have to agree with you i think sometimes we can you know if we're going for a walk or we're trying to get somewhere we, we literally have blinkers on and we don't actually we're not in the present moment and we're not looking right um and then you know you, you can miss opportunities like that um you know that that uh, if you just paid enough attention to what was around you and yeah. it, it have that ex what i call expanded awareness it's kind of coming out of the tunnel vision and kind of going okay and then feeling your way into it too mm -hmm. uh, always looking always look up yeah. and down, and down. <laughs> don't trip yes don't trip. <laughs> Especially in Africa, because there are lots of ants and all kinds of little creatures on the ground. And you want to try to avoid stepping on them, number one. But also, you can't believe how much life is, you know, happening oh, yeah. wherever you're walking. I mean, it is quite incredible. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, thank you, Kathy. Um, that was fantastic. And I'm sure that uh, anybody watching this uh, presentation will be um, certainly much more enlightened and certainly can take quite a lot of what you said and put it into practice because at the end of the day practice 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 exactly exactly <laughs> and have fun that's it that's also part of it yeah don't take it too seriously no <laughs> <laughs> okay yes. thanks very much kathy really appreciate that and if anybody's interested to find out more information about kathy and her photography then please feel free to email me um, you can find my address at uh, www.myavataradventure.com or tpeters at Top Speaker Events. And I will pass on Kathy's details to you. She has a fantastic website where she's uploaded her photographs um, and lots more to come. And uh, she's going to be joining us on our trip um, going to Kenya this year. So we're very excited about that as our official photographer. So I'm, oh, really excited. I'm super you. excited. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Kathy. You're very welcome, Tamar. Okay. All right.